For as much as we all love a crafty submission or a long drawn out battle, every fight fan worth his salt is truly there for the knockouts. And for this video, we're going to look at some based the sport of mixed martial arts. These are the wildest ragdoll KOs in MMA history. Lyoto Machida vs. Rashad Evans You know a knockout is bad when it practically earned meme status before memes were even a thing. And when Rashad Evans clashed with his fellow champion of the light heavyweight division, Lyoto Machida, fans expected to see some serious fireworks. For as much as Machida is known for his dazzling feints and masterful footwork, he got down and dirty with Rashad early here, and in a huge flurry, the Dragon managed to absolutely fold Evans like a deck chair, putting his lights out for one of the year's most violent finishes. Machida might be a technician in there, but don't sleep on his finishing abilities, folks. Francis Ngannou vs. Jarzinho Rosenstruck is there a more dangerous man in mixed martial arts history than former UFC heavyweight champion Francis Ngannou? Well, punch for punch, there is no fighter in the sport who can hang with him in a firefight. Even the experienced kickboxer Jarzinho Rosenstruck, whose best path to victory would have certainly been to score a KO, he couldn't even last 30 seconds in there with the Predator. This was a point in time where Ngannou was really feeling himself, and he knew that he only needed to land once to get his man out of there. A total demolition job. Matt Brown vs. Diego Sanchez It's crazy to think just how many great fighters Matt Brown has managed to outlast in the UFC. Entire careers have started and ended while this welterweight icon has been doing work. And somehow, some way, he's still KOing dudes to this day. So, when he took on his fellow action fighter Diego Sanchez a few years back, the fans were correct to expect a knockout. And sure enough, the Immortal delivered, catching Diego's leg and carrying him right into range for a massive elbow that sat Sanchez down there and then. A career best highlight for Brown. Justin Gagey vs. James Vick in some parallel universe, James Vick could have been a great lightweight contender, but a spell of disastrous knockout losses left this prospect totally frozen out of the UFC before he had reached his potential. One of the worst defeats came against Justin Gagey, during a time where the highlight had a real point to prove. And after stalking his prey for a few exchanges, Gagey unloaded a thunderous overhand shot that sent Vick crashing to the canvas. No follow-up needed, just pure violence from the BMF King. Robbie Lawler vs. Nico Price Retirements in MMA are often quite a sad experience. It's a cruel sport, and more often than not, most fighters end up going out on a real low. But Robbie Lawler is not most fighters, and when his retirement fight came around, he charged out of the gates looking to make a major statement. Nico Price never stood a chance. Lawler connected early before tying him up in the clinch, unloading a series of huge power shots that broke the fan favorite before the first minute had even finished. A truly special retirement moment for the ruthless one. Yair Rodriguez vs. Chan Sung Jung Better late than never is a saying that applies as much to MMA as it does to any other sport. And for Yair Rodriguez, it didn't matter that he had been struggling to get the better of the Korean zombie Chan Sung Jung for large portions of their legendary five-round matchup. Sure, Jung was up on the cards, but in the dying seconds of round five, Jung decided to go on the offensive, charging headfirst into a wild, unorthodox upward elbow, eating the counter clean on the chin. And when he dropped limp to the mat, everyone in that arena not named Yair Rodriguez had absolutely no idea what they had just seen. A true one in a million KO. Kamzat Chimaev vs. Gerald Mearshart A star like Kamzat Chimaev comes around only once every few years, and while we were all focused on his dominant and destructive wrestling and ground and pound game, Kamzat was gearing up for something special in his middleweight debut. Taking on the tried and tested Gerald Mearshart, Kamzat took just 14 seconds to KO the veteran stiff, slumping him to the canvas with a knockout blow that made us all sit up and realize that this Chechen powerhouse was no one-trick pony. Alex Perrieta vs. Sean Strickland 
Sean Strickland is one crazy character, folks. But in the grand scheme of things, he is without question the only fighter in the middleweight division who is crazy enough to try and outstrike the former two-weight kickboxing world champion Alex Pereira. To this day, it's damn near impossible to try and understand what Strickland was attempting to do. But when Perietta found his timing, and it did not take him long, the results were a highlight reel finish and a defeat that Strickland will never live down. Fedor Emelianenko vs. Andre Arlovsky Fedor Emelianenko had his hands full when he squared off with a prime Andre Arlovsky under the Affliction banner. Arlovsky's hand speed and aggression were really giving the last emperor problems in there. And after he cornered Fedor and moved in to put some real damage on him, fans were starting to suspect the upset. But Arlovsky decided to dive in with a flying knee that, let's be real, was not a good idea. Realizing this, Emelianenko uncorked a vicious overhand shot that brought the airborne Arlovsky right back down to earth almost immediately. Gabriel Gonzaga vs. Mirko Krokop on the long list of fighters who beat their opponent at their own game, is there a more dramatic example than when Gabriel Gonzaga managed to crow cop Mirko crow cop? Well, out of all of the outcomes we could have gotten, the idea of Gonzaga setting up Mirko for a KO with his own trademark head kick? Yeah, this one was another level of crazy. And when that shot landed, crow cop folded to the mat like an electric current had been sent through his body one of the all-time great upset wins. Israel Adesanya vs. Alex Pereira 2 Revenge is a dish best served with a gigantic knockout, and for Israel Adesanya, so many fans had doubted his ability to ever get a win over his old kickboxing rival Alex Pereira. Despite losing the majority of the rounds they had shared across three fights, Potan just had a way of finding Izzy's chin. But in their MMA rematch for the 185-pound belt, Adesanya had a plan. This time, he wasn't prepared to play it safe. This time, he had to dive head first into the fire. And just as it seemed like Perietta was about to move to 4-0, Adesanya sprung the trap. Instead of cowering and trying to defend, Izzy fired off a counter shot, stunning Perietta enough to land the one decisive blow that would win him his belt back. A KO of the year contender, a magical performance. Jiri Prohatska vs. Volkan Ozdemir Jiri Prohatska had some pretty considerable hype behind him by the time he debuted in the UFC's 205-pound division, so much so that the promotion decided to give him a top 10 test immediately, setting him up for a clash with Volkan Ozdemir. And man, did Jiri take this opportunity with open arms. He set a crazy pace early on, letting the fans know exactly what type of fighter he was. And when Vulcan began to wilt, Prohatska piled on the pressure, eventually connecting with a huge overhand that signaled to the rest of the light heavyweight division that a new contender had arrived. Little did we know, but we were watching a future champion make his first definitive statement. Francis Ngannou vs. Stipe Miocic 2 the Francis Ngannou who faced Stipe Miocic for the heavyweight title at UFC 220 was a far inferior fighter to the one who bulldozed his way through the division to get his rematch. And in that opening round, in there with the champ, you could just tell that Stipe wasn't feeling too confident. I mean, would you, if you were faced with power like Ngannou's? In the second round, Miocic was forced to open up his offense, and after staggering Francis with a huge counter shot, he rushed in for the kill. Unfortunately, this mistake proved to be his undoing, and this time when Ngannou found his mark, there was no getting up from it. Jorge Masvidal vs. Ben Askren If you talk a big game, you better be prepared to back it up when it matters most. And when it came to the welterweight showdown between Jorge Masvidal and Ben Askren, these two guys talked their way into one of 2019's most memorable feuds. But on fight night, only one man was able to deliver the goods. Masvidal immediately launched himself into an audacious flying knee, reading Askren's intentions like a book. And when that knee landed, Ben was as stiff as a board. And those follow-up shots to the very clearly unconscious Askren 
Well, if you ask Jorge, he'll tell you that they were super necessary. Michael Chandler versus Tony Ferguson. And finally, we end on a knockout that left an entire sport with a tear in their eye. Tony Ferguson's prime years contained some of the most memorable performances in the history of the lightweight division, but to say that his decline was a tough watch would be putting it lightly. After a strong opening round against Michael Chandler, Tony seemed to be getting back to his old self. However, fate had something cruel in store for El Cucuy. And in a moment of sheer brilliance, Chandler unloaded a monstrous front kick that landed flush on Tony's chin, sending him into the stratosphere for one of the year's most vicious KOs. From blatant eye gouging to trying to rip your opponent's knee apart, we're bringing you some of the most disgusting examples of terrible sportsmanship in MMA that we could find. And to kick things off, we have a UFC title fight finish that left a bad taste in everyone's mouth. John Jones deserves all the credit in the world for how he adapted to the odd karate style of Lyoto Machida and came back from an uncertain round one to finish the dragon in round two. But when he caught the former champ in that standing guillotine and just let his unconscious body drop to the floor, indeed, it was a cold, badass moment. But that was a highly disrespectful thing to do to such an esteemed championship level icon. However, things get even worse for our next entry and a later appearance from UFC 1 finalist Gerard Gordo. In a tight clinch exchange with his opponent Yuki Nakai, Gordo was filmed very clearly gouging at his opponent's eyes when the ref wasn't looking. That's a dirty move, right? Well, to make things worse, Nakai actually lost all sight in one of his eyes after this fight, giving the event a much darker conclusion. You guys ever heard of Husimar Palhares? Well, on the surface, he's a talented grappler with a mastery of leg locks. But for some reason, this dude refuses to let go of subs. And his reputation for destroying limbs has caused him to be blacklisted by most serious promoters. And when he caught Jake Shields in a Kimura, those extra milliseconds of torquing on his arm could have done immense damage. This guy is a total barbarian in there. Look up the term dirty fighter in the dictionary and you'll likely find a picture of Gilbert Ivel staring back at you. This dude is an all-timer when it comes to fouls and getting himself DQ'd. And he even let his infamous rage get the better of him by KOing a referee who he felt was trying to fix one of his fights. Ivel even kicked him when he was down just to make sure he had gotten his point across. Sure, this Finland-based ref was clearly corrupt and doing his utmost to screw Ivel out of a win. But was it all really worth it? That's the question. Very few MMA promoters in the world would go near this dude after this massive controversy, and can you really blame them? Karma can come around very quickly in MMA, and when Eric Silva faked a glove touch only to swipe at Nordin Taleb with a big hook, it was clear that he wasn't going to win any fans. Thankfully, the MMA gods blessed Taleb with the ability to KO him shortly after. Eric Silva went from one of the most promising prospects in all of MMA to a real mid-level talent who could just never put it all together. All in all, justice was served in the octagon on this day. This next one is a real two-for-one kind of deal. Josh Koscheck very clearly faked being hit by an illegal knee just to get a point docked from Paul Daly before then lying on top of him for three rounds. Oh, wait a minute. He didn't even hit him. You'd be angry too, right? Well, Daly then proceeded to ruin his UFC career by sucker punching Koshek after the bell. And yes, he lost his contract. And to this day, it's the moment that Daly is unfortunately best known for. Next up, in Ahmed al-Darmaki, we have one of the biggest idiots to ever lace up gloves and fight. Firstly, this dude refused to let go of a rear naked choke that he had successfully used to win his fight. But then, he decided to have a go at the comparatively massive veteran referee Mark Goddard, making himself look like the biggest crybaby to ever grace an MMA cage. Who knows what he was thinking, but he hasn't been seen in MMA since. Okay, so this one is quite interesting. Depending on which side of the fence you fall on, this could be a case of two guys being at fault or some well-deserved justice being handed out. 
Heath Herring was getting ready to take on Yoshihiro Nakao when the Japanese heavyweight decided to plant a kiss right on his lips during the staredown. Herring immediately responded by KOing him there and then. Right or wrong, it was most certainly Nakao who was at fault more. How Priscilla Cachoeira is still in the UFC after this, we do not know. Her blatant eye gouges against Jillian Robertson were simply disgusting. She used them in an attempt to get out of a submission, and somehow she's still in the promotion, having competed three times since then. An all-time dirty move inside the cage. Okay, so this one isn't technically against the rules, but coming from a guy like John Jones, it's easy to look at his intent here as pretty obvious bad sportsmanship. When he faced off against the future UFC light heavyweight champion Glover Teixeira, he immediately began looking for opportunities to limit the Brazilian contender's power. And so, when he caught Glover in the clinch, he started to bend his arm awkwardly out hoping to snap it, or at the very least, make it ineffective from there onwards. Again, it's not illegal, but man, John Jones has a real underlying cruelty to him. That much is clear. Shinya Aoki is a bona fide legend of Japanese MMA, an icon whose submission game made him one of the finest lightweights on the planet during his prime. But when he took on fierce rival Mizuto Hirota, he left with a black mark on his legacy that he might never live down. After breaking Hirota's arm with a submission, Aoki decided to immediately rub it in his opponent's face, flipping the bird at him as he howled in agony before then doing the same to his coaches. And he did this all with a maniacal grin on his face. That's one cold dude right there. As time goes on, the MMA fan base are becoming more and more aware of the fact that Israel Adesanya is a very weird guy. And after putting on a dominant performance against Paulo Costa that saw the Brazilian totally shut down from the first bell to the second round TKO, he decided to celebrate in a way that can only be described as, well, a little over the top. Naturally, Costa didn't know what happened at the time. But when he found out, to say he was furious was an understatement. Just how far can you take things when it comes to punishing someone who has trash-talked you? Well, it's not like Ben Askren was crossing too many lines in the build-up to his fight with Jorge Masvidal. But when you make an enemy of a guy like Gamebred, the consequences are always going to be high. So when Jorge finished the fight in a record-breaking five seconds with a huge flying knee, his super-necessary follow-up punches and the mocking celebration seemed extremely cruel. But hey, that's just Masvidal. He doesn't take kindly to disrespect, that's for sure. Bad sportsmanship can come in many forms, but for Ronda Rousey, it was something as simple as not making peace with a fierce rival after a hard-fought battle. Misha Tate had just survived way longer than any of Ronda's previous opponents, but when the third round armbar came, her attempts to shake the hand of her opponent were left with total rejection from the bantamweight queen. Rousey was a bad winner, but time would eventually show us that she was an even worse loser. This one right here is on a different level. Takeo Shinya managed to win his fight fair and square with a knockout blow. But in that moment, he decided he wasn't done and proceeded to keep hitting his opponent. And when the ref tried to stop him, he hit him as well. It was a scene of total chaos and evidence that Shinya was about to burn all of his bridges within the sport. Eventually, Shinya was restrained, but this is one of the worst post-fight moments you will ever see in mixed martial arts. TJ Dillashaw is one insanely competitive dude. His reputation as a bit of a jerk in the gym translated to a heated feud with his former teammate Cody Garbrandt. And when they met for the bantamweight title at UFC 217, Dillashaw's eventual TKO win came with some added personal meaning. And in that moment, he couldn't help himself but roar like a maniac in the clearly concussed Garbrandt's face. Call it a warranted release of energy if you like, but it's definitely not good sportsmanship in our book. Okay, so this one on the surface looks pretty bad. Keith Hackney was trying to fight his way out of Joe Sun's grip, and because the early rule set of the UFC was so loose, hitting your opponent in the groin was actually legal. And so, that's exactly what he did. But here's the thing, 
If you feel bad for Joe-san, just know that he's currently in jail for the most horrific of crimes, which we can't even get into without risking demonetization. So we're not too mad at Hackney here. In fact, some might say that Joe-san deserves worse. And finally, we come to another guy whose reputation as a dirty fighter precedes him. Mike Kyle had gotten into a pretty heated feud with Brian Olsen ahead of his fight, and despite getting what looked like a perfectly good TKO victory, Kyle decided that he was not finished. And after pushing the ref out of the way, he went back in to land several more shots, eventually getting his win overturned to a DQ loss. A reputation-destroying performance. Makes you wonder just what was going through this guy's mind. Look, we all love a good overhand knockout punch, but when it comes to mixed martial arts, there is no knockout technique more electrifying than a spinning kick. And the capoeira expert uses these techniques far better than anyone else. These are the wildest capoeira KOs in MMA. And to kick things off, what better place to begin than with one of the purest capoeira users in the sport? Marcus Aurelio is a capoeira technician through and through, and in this early career fight against Keegan Marshall, he did not make any attempts to disguise his intentions. No, Aurelio was going for the kill, and he was gunning for a finish using his beloved capoeira. And when he finally spanned into range and found his opponent's chin, it was one of the most unique KOs you will ever see. A 720-degree spin with the first arc as a range finder? Yeah, this was a wild technique to even attempt. And the connection on his target's chin ensured that Aurelio would earn himself one hell of a viral moment. And trust us, we're not done with this capoeira master for this video just yet. Another classic example of clean capoeira technique comes in next, as Cairo Rocha span with the fluidity of a man who has been throwing these kicks for decades. Everything from the speed and accuracy to the perfect judgment of the distance between himself and his target. It was all perfect. Some fighters can throw spinning attacks like a boxer throws a jab. Total efficiency of movement. And when this kick landed, its impact was immediate. A brutal knockout and a highlight that any striker would be proud of. Capoeira has its drawbacks as a base skill for MMA, but when it's good, it can be absolutely lethal. If you've ever watched a capoeira demonstration in full fight, a lot of entertainment stems from seeing two practitioners spinning and interweaving their kicks so closely that you just cannot believe that they're not landing on each other. And for this amateur MMA fighter, Ollie Flint, he seemed to take a leaf out of the capoeira book, but instead of dancing with his opponent, he used his knowledge to land on the inside of his rival's own kick. It's not often you see a perfect example of a kick being used as a counter, but that is exactly what we saw here. If you don't have the courage to take risks, you're never going to end up with moments like this. And for the former UFC fighter Brian Ebersole, he decided to attempt the most bizarre technique in all of combat sports out of nowhere during this regional level fight. For some reason, Ebersole took it upon himself to throw a cartwheel kick with absolutely zero telegraphing. Sure, he could have very easily looked foolish if he had lost, but somehow, some way, it landed. You could watch MMA for another 10 years and never see a knockout quite as wild as this one. A 10 out of 10. So, we're going to break our own rules here for a bit. Sure, this KO came from an esteemed kickboxer, Raymond Daniels, and it wasn't actually a kick. But this beautifully executed KO was filled to the brim with capoeira flair. Daniels hypnotized his opponent with his spinning movement here, but instead of doing the expected thing and uncorking his hips with a kick, he decided to fool everyone and switch to an overhand. Was the spinning motion really necessary? Maybe, maybe not. But you can't argue with the results. And Raymond Daniels has a better highlight reel than most. For this one, we'll leave the final judgment up to you. But when Joaquin Buckley had his kick caught by his opponent, he had a few options. But instead of waiting around to find out what his rival would do, he decided to explode, channeling his full potential kinetic force, uncorking a wild spinning back kick that landed directly on its intended target's chin. Yeah, this wasn't capoeira per se, but this wild technique most certainly took from the martial arts philosophy. It was all about improvisation, fluidity, and explosiveness. And Joaquin Buckley showcased them in all spades here. The 
rolling thunder is a truly strange technique to try in any combat sport. But in MMA in particular, doing a front flip that ends with a kick attempt is always going to put you in an awkward position if your opponent has some skills on the ground. But for Davi Gallon, he decided to try his luck at one of the lowest percentage kicks in the game. And believe it or not, he absolutely nailed it, landing his shot cleanly on the UFC veteran Ross Pearson to put him out cold with a capital C. And the commentators could not help but go totally overboard in their reaction. And to be fair, can you really blame them? The sheer power on display here was totally wild. Sometimes, when less skilled fighters throw spinning hook kicks, they throw it without truly aiming and hope for the best. But a guy like this, who has clear talent for spinning, was so flexible that he was able to spin his head around faster than the kick, taking note of his target before his shot landed. In other words, he knew exactly where his kick was going, looking over his shoulder to ensure maximal impact. And while we don't know for certain if he has had Capoeira training, it's pretty clear from his fluidity that there is at least some influence there. Okay, okay, we know that Chris Barnett is not a Capoeira fighter per se, but the dude throws the type of spinning kicks frequently that would be totally at home in a demonstration in Rio de Janeiro. And in this shocking heavyweight matchup in the UFC, Barnett left the world totally stunned when he landed a spinning hook kick on the tried and tested John Vellante. And man, just one look at Barnett's physique is enough to tell you that a man that large should not be able to move like that. A remarkable piece of athleticism from the fan favorite Barnett. We've had a few KOs that firmly fall into a gray category, but trust us, this next one is pure capoeira at its core. The setup movement was as clean as can be, making it damn near impossible for his opponent to get a read on what was coming. And by the time the impact came, the results spoke for themselves. A shockingly picturesque finish and a very worthy inclusion for our video. Capoeira KOs and mixed martial arts rarely come along as good as this one right here. The early MMA fights of the great Michael Venom Page were more like executions than actual contests. The guy is clearly a very good fighter, but for the first few years of his career, it was very obvious that he was being fed cans. And on this occasion, MVP have one of his earliest viral moments, showing absolutely no respect for his opponent's striking skills by basically letting him get to his feet just so he could wind up an outrageously beautiful tornado kick right to the dome. And the fact that Page didn't even check on his opponent before celebrating tells you everything you need to know. We go to Cage Warriors next, and one of the greatest examples of an improvised spinning hook kick that you will ever see. This guy was practically falling off balance when he saw an opening for his shot, and if we didn't see it coming, it makes sense that his opponent was also caught totally off guard. And as the old saying goes, it's the shots you don't see coming that hurt the most. Extra points are given here for the very quick thinking that led to this viral KO. There's a certain sweet spot on the chin that just makes a spinning kick's trajectory look that bit cleaner. The kick doesn't hit the side of the head and lose its momentum, no, it clips the chin and finishes its arc. And that's what we saw from this spinning hook kick. There's little to no telegraphing here, and all that was needed was the slightest of impacts, and every single person in that arena knew that the fight was done. A beautiful example that can only be really pulled off by a fighter of tremendous experience and talent. We're gonna mix things up again here. Remember Marcus Aurelio? Well, as one of the foremost capoeira practitioners to score viral KOs in MMA, it's only natural that he has more than a few under his belt. And for this clip, he used his wide, arching spins to shepherd his opponent right onto the cage side. And once he had him exactly where he wanted him, instead of spinning once more, he threw every inch of power he had into an audacious jumping switch kick that sent his adversary with a one-way ticket to the Shadow Realm. We have a very relevant knockout coming in next, with one of the few fighters to make it to the UFC with a capoeira base. Eliseo Zaleski Dos Santos might not have made it all the way to the top of the middleweight division, but he does hold a spinning kick KO over the current champion of the weight class, Sean Strickland. And for a pretty obscure fighting art in the sport of capoeira, this is one hell of a feather in his cap. Strickland, just like the rest of us, never saw it coming. 
And finally, we're gonna break our rules again. We, but it's arguably one of the greatest KOs, period. Women's MMA has become such an integral part of the sport's upper levels that it's hard to imagine the UFC, PFL, Bellator, or any major promotion without them. And for this video, we're going to take a look at 10 knockouts that have truly defined women's mixed martial arts over the last decade. Here are the craziest KOs they had to offer. A future star of the UFC's flyweight division comes in first with a knockout that was just about as brutal as you'll ever see. Erin Blanchfield might be best known for her Khabib-like wrestling and overbearing ground-and-pound game, but this highlight showcased her striking to its fullest. This young budding superstar landed a rapid head kick that totally floored her opponent, allowing her to move in for the TKO finish. Blanchfield has already destroyed huge names at 125 pounds, including Molly McCann and Jessica Andrade. And with her now ranked at number three in the world, it's clear that this 24-year-old will eventually get her hands on UFC gold. So if you thought she was just a wrestler, think again. Next up, we have a prime example of why taunting can be a terrible idea inside the octagon. It's all well and good trying to provoke your opponent into making a mistake if you have a clear advantage over them. But Beth Correa is far, far inferior to striker Holly Holm. And despite her not having any degree of control over their fight on the feet, Correa still thought that taunting Holly was a good idea. She didn't just do it once either. No, Beth did it multiple times. So when Holly landed her trademark head kick and put her down once and for all, it was easy to see this as a major example of karma striking with no mercy. We don't want to be picking on Beth Correa in this video, but man, she makes it so easy sometimes. Correa found her way into a title shot against the great Ronda Rousey during the height of the bantamweight champion superstardom. Rousey was on top of the world at that point, and she had an unbeatable aura surrounding her that caused most people to totally write off Beth's chances. Correa surely knew this as well, and so she tried to bring out the dog in Rousey by attacking her on the mic with some truly harsh and personal trash talk. Maybe, just maybe, this would cause Ronda to break focus and use her striking instead of her unstoppable judo. Well, it did. Unfortunately, Rousey was also a far better puncher than Correa, and she proceeded to beat the brakes off her, KOing her inside a minute. Jessica Andrade is going to make a lot of appearances in this video. She is without question one of the most physically imposing fighters to have ever competed in women's MMA a veteran who has proven her power across three different divisions. And while we will be seeing some highlights from Andrade soon, it's her billing as a total powerhouse that made Zhang Weili's sub-minute destruction of her in China so incredible. Weili was one hell of a prospect, sure, but she absolutely destroyed Andrade from the beginning of this bout to its very quick conclusion. Outmuscling her physically and dominating her in the clinch, Zhang ran through the strawweight queen in under a minute to steal her 115-pound title away. A star-making performance for this breakout superstar. But up next, as promised, we're going to bring you one of Jessica Andrade's most memorable knockouts. A one-hitter-quitter finish that you very rarely see the likes of in women's MMA. Because Jessica Andrade has a punch that most fighters would kill for. And when she landed this clean shot on Karolina Kowalkiewicz's chin, the knockout of the year race earned itself a new contender. This massive overhand seemed like it came from a fighter two weight classes above Andrade, and the way that Karolina dropped, we're guessing she had never experienced power like that before. Andrade is almost like a cheat code in that strawweight division, folks. Up next, we go to one of the great nights in British MMA history, the legendary UFC London event that brought us finish after finish, thrill after thrill, and several star-making performances. Maybe the most famous one of all came from Molly McCann, a veteran fan favorite who was coming under increased attention due to her links to the rising talent, Paddy Pimblett. She took on Luana Carolina in a fierce, high-tempo performance that, like most of her fights, really got the home crowd going. But when she managed to time Luana for the perfect spinning back elbow in the third round, she damn near sent the place into a riot. Knockouts rarely come better than this one. 
The timing, the setup, the execution, all totally flawless from McCann. And it was enough to earn her a lucrative contract with Barstool Sports, which only makes it that bit better, right? Valentina Shevchenko wasn't always known as a finisher during her time as a champ, but when she did manage to pull off the stoppage, the results were usually devastating. And when the champ took on Jessica I, she served up one of her very best. After hammering the body over and over with kicks, she changed her target, aiming high with a head kick that landed cleanly on the challenger's dome. The follow-up shot sent I to the shadow realm once and for all, making this by far and away the most emphatic finish on Valentina's title reign, a truly destructive statement to the rest of the division. There's nothing quite like seeing two of the greatest fighters in a division's history facing off. And when Zhang Weili and Ioana Jędrzejczyk fought for the first time, that bout was one of the greatest in the history of women's MMA, arguably the single best fight of all time. But their rematch? Well, that was a lot more straightforward. Zhang had evolved into something truly beyond Ioana. And after muscling her way through an impressive first round, she landed the spinning back fist from hell that would send the legendary Polish champion straight into retirement. A picture-perfect knockout in a fight that marked a real passing of the torch at 115 pounds. Speaking of Joanna, we unfortunately have to include her again with yet another famous defeat in her back catalog. Though she was a legend of the sport, her later years saw several other major stars of the strawweight division rise up and take some of her momentum and make it their own. Thug Rose Namajunas was the first fighter to truly get the better of Joanna, coming into their strawweight title fight at the height of Joanna's fame. But man, she did not take long to assert herself on this fight. Despite being more a grappler than her Muay Thai counterpart, Namayunas took charge of the striking early, dropping Joanna to the mat in one of the opening exchanges. The fans, the commentary booth, and maybe even Joanna herself probably thought it was a fluke. But when Rose landed for a second time, she actually caused the champ to tap out, although the TKO was caused. A perfect performance. Jessica Andrade makes her final appearance on this video this time for the totally insane finish to her clash with Rose Namajunas for the title. After Rose beat Ioana for a second time, people really started to wonder just how far this young sensation could actually go. And so, when Jessica Andrade stepped up to the challenge for the belt, Rose was expected to take home a comfortable win. For the opening minutes, it certainly looked as though she was about to do just that. But after latching on to an ill-advised Kimura attempt in the clinch, Andrade managed to hoist Nama Yunus into the air and slam her down on her head with an almost WWE-esque level of flair. Should Rose have let go of her sub attempt? Probably. But this was a uniquely violent KO, that's for sure. How could we make a video like this and not give a mention to this legendary moment? Both Holly Holm and Ronda Rousey have already featured here early on, but this is the moment that will define their careers for decades to come. Rousey had all the hype coming in. She was this unbeatable force of nature at the top of the bantamweight pile. And in Holly Holm, she had another contender being brought forth for the slaughter. Or at least, that's what we thought. No, as it turned out, Rousey's ability to strike had been severely overstated. And in there with a multiple-time world championship boxer, her entire game unraveled for the world to see. Holm beat Rousey in every facet of this fight. And when the second round came and a straight shot staggered the unbeaten champ, Holm landed her signature head kick over the top to bring Ronda's empire crashing down around her. And finally, we come to Chris Cyborg's featherweight title defense against the rising bantamweight queen, Amanda Nunez. Cyborg was the favorite here. She hadn't lost in a decade, and by the time she landed in the UFC, she had a terrifying aura about her, a reputation as the most fearsome KO artist in the history of women's MMA. Nunez, who was making her 145-pound debut, was a pretty commendable knockout artist in her own right. But how could she ever hope to survive in there with her fellow Brazilian brawler? Well, as it turned out, Nunez was not afraid. And when she dove head first into the flames with Cyborg, she somehow managed to get the better of her almost immediately. 
a 10-year reign of dominance came crashing down with a series of massive punches, and it took her less than a minute, an insane fight-ending sequence. From pre-fight nightmares to harrowing scenes in the cage, for this video we're going to take a look at just how dangerous MMA can be. Here are some MMA fighters who nearly died doing this sport. And to kick things off, we have one of the most insane wins in UFC history. Cal Worsham might not be a name that is immediately familiar to most modern fans, but when he took on Zane Frazier, he was forced to dig deeper than you could ever possibly imagine. After eating a massive step-in knee from his much bigger opponent, Worsham kept a solid poker face. What we didn't know was that Frazier had just shattered Worsham's ribs, causing a collapsed lung and damage to his heart. Seriously, we cannot overstate how dangerous this could have been. Thankfully, this dude had the heart of a lion and somehow took down and TKO'd Frazier within the opening three minutes. If he had eaten another shot to the chest, this potentially life-threatening situation would have no doubt escalated into something far darker. Robert Whitaker was just hours away from defending his middleweight crown against Kelvin Gastelum when he was forced to pull out of the contest, leaving the main event in tatters. According to his team, Whitaker had to undergo emergency surgery due to a collapsed bowel and abdominal hernia of the intestine. Had he fought against Gastelum as planned and received a blow to the midsection, this could have turned into a fatal moment for the Reaper. It's a terrifying example of why it's so important to have solid medical examinations for these fighters. And thankfully, Whitaker made a full recovery, eventually making his way back to the octagon seven months later. Evangelista Santos, the original cyborg of MMA, was the man who also gave his nickname to his now ex-wife, Christiane Justino, the living legend of women's MMA. But when he came up against Michael Venom Page in Bellator, it was clear that he was past his prime. And after a feeling out process, once MVP had his timing down, he leapt into a surprise flying knee, one that caught Cyborg cleanly in the face. Cyborg immediately rolled over in pain, but he wasn't knocked out. No, the end result here was much worse. MVP had landed so cleanly on his target that it had actually caved the Brazilian's skull in. This was a true one-in-a-million kind of injury, a blow that brought Santos's career to an end. And according to the doctors, it could have killed him if he didn't get lucky. One of the most devastating strikes in MMA history. The first of several disastrous weight cuts comes in next in the form of Jake Hadley's clash with Cody Durden earlier this year. Coming into this bout, Hadley was on a two-fight winning streak, but according to his post-fight statements following a unanimous decision loss, his weight cut was absolute hell. In fact, he claims that he almost died trying to shave off those final pounds. His exact words, he saw God for a moment. That's a pretty wild revelation, right? Well, according to Hadley, this pre-fight nightmare affected his ability to perform on fight night in a huge way, telling his fans he was unable to step on the gas in the way he normally does. All things considered, though, the fact that he even made it to the octagon is commendable, because by the sound of things, this weight cut could have had far more drastic effects on him than simply ruining his performance. Anyone ever watch Max Holloway's fight with Charles Oliveira? Well, if you did, you'll know the bout was a total non-contest. In one of the earliest exchanges, Charles Dubronx dropped down to the mat, and moments later, it became clear that something was off. Oliveira had injured his neck, and Max was awarded the TKO victory. It wasn't a clean win by any means, and fans felt as if they had been cheated out of a fight but none of us had any idea just how serious an injury this was. Oliveira had torn his esophagus, an injury that, if it had become worse, could have been fatal. Tears to the esophagus are very rare, even for an MMA fighter, but an injury such as this one can allow fluid to leak into the lungs in the worst cases. Thankfully, the fight was called off and Oliveira was able to make a quick recovery. And to this day, this potentially dangerous injury has never reared its head. 
This is a rare example of an early UFC bout that produced two champions in two different weight classes. And though we never did get to see the fight play out, this injury marks its place in the history books. Brian Barbarena was putting the finishing touches on a solid training camp when he ate a hard body kick from his sparring partner. At the time, it didn't seem too impactful, and so Barbarena, being the warrior he is, continued on finishing the session. Later that day, he began to experience an odd, fuzzy feeling in his body before some brutal pains in his abdomen prefaced him losing consciousness. He would later learn that he had ruptured two arteries in his abdomen, an injury that could have killed him if medical treatment wasn't on hand. Barbarina had to undergo emergency surgery to have four liters of blood drained from his stomach before a transfusion. And according to Brian himself, he didn't realize how close he had come to dying until a couple of weeks after that point when he was told he would have been a goner if he wasn't dealt with a few minutes later. Khabib Nurmagomedov might be the greatest lightweight of all time. In fact, that's pretty undisputed at this point. But it doesn't mean that he always had an easy time in making the 155-pound limit. No, Khabib was one of the bigger lightweights in recent memory, and throughout his career there were several instances of him struggling to make weight. And prior to what could have been a matchup with Tony Ferguson at UFC 209, the Eagle was forced out of his fight after a no-show at the weigh-ins 24 hours before fight time. Nurmagomedov was hospitalized on the Friday of fight week due to extreme stomach pains. Upon telling the doctors of his plan to fight the following day, they told him he had very nearly died and that fighting was not an option. In the end, we never did get to see Khabib and Tony fighting, but to his credit, Nurmagomedov did a better job at monitoring his weight from this point onwards. Sometimes, the difference between a very fortunate moment and a tragic one is a fighter who is capable of keeping a level head in a win-or-lose situation. And for Chad George, he had managed to score an unorthodox Von Flu choke on his opponent Mark Vorgas, the type of sub that most fans wouldn't spot in real time. But if you're a referee, you don't have the excuse of being a casual onlooker. And somehow, this referee totally failed in his ability to see it for what it was. It took George to stand up and shout in his face that the fight was over for the ref to come to his senses. Seriously, we can't give enough credit to Chad George here. Not only did he have the presence of mind to know that his opponent was out cold, but he also very clearly had a good heart and a healthy compassion for his fallen adversary. If there had been a slightly less merciful fighter here, this could have been a truly horrific situation. Vorgas was deprived of oxygen for long enough at that point that a few more seconds could have been devastating. Chris Cyborg didn't initially have a place in the UFC to call home, given that the promotion's heaviest women's division was 135 pounds. And upon her arrival in the top flight, the UFC put on a pair of 140-pound catchweight bouts, probably hoping that, over time, Cyborg could slim down and eventually make bantamweight opening up a fight with their biggest star, Ronda Rousey. But Cyborg was just too big, and no amount of dieting was going to change that. Eventually, the promotion relented and set up a featherweight division for her to rule. But this did not happen until some harrowing footage of Chris Cyborg trying to cut weight came to the surface. In this footage, you could see the fearsome Brazilian fighter in absolute agony as she tried to shave off those final pounds and make weight. It was a pretty disturbing viewing experience for the fans, and when word emerged from her camp that she had very nearly suffered permanent damage due to this gargantuan cut, it was clear that something needed to change. This was a 145-pound fighter through and through, and asking her to cut any more was quite frankly ridiculous. Look, Kimbo Slice vs. Dada 5000 was a terrible fight, maybe one of the worst major headliners in MMA history. But there is a certain dark energy to this bout that carried on long after the laughter stopped. Because at first, when it was fun to joke about these two terribly conditioned athletes flailing at each other, the post-fight scene was far from a laughing matter. Kimbo basically won the fight by being the fighter who didn't fall to the floor from exhaustion. 
it wasn't even a knockout, although it technically stood as a TKO. No, Dada literally slumped to the mat, and the ref was forced to call this dreadful fight off there and then. After being rushed to the hospital, Dada reportedly suffered cardiac arrest, kidney failure, and severe dehydration. On top of that, Kimbo would fail a drug test for the bout and would tragically pass away just four months later from heart failure. It was a real freak show matchup on paper, a matchup between two very unskilled street fighters that wasn't truly for the hardcore fans, but this bout took on a far darker tone as time went on. One of the most infamous matchups in MMA history on many different levels. MMA is a pretty crazy sport, full of high stakes and tension, and with that being the case, it's only natural that things get a little zany from time to time, and these are 20 of the most ridiculous moments you'll ever see in mixed martial arts. And what better way to kick things off than with perhaps the single most awkward post-fight interview of all time? We'll set the scene. Gray Maynard had just managed to TKO Rob Emerson with a slam that seemed to cause major pain to his opponent's ribs. The problem? Well, Maynard himself was KO'd by the slam as well. And when Joe Rogan took him to one side for the post-fight interview, the clearly concussed lightweight did not for one second accept the fact that he had went out. Joe being Joe, he decided to make things extra awkward by forcing the very confused Maynard to watch the slam back, talking him through his self-knockout stage by stage. Yikes. Take a look at this. Look at the replay, bro. Bro, look at the replay. You picked him up, watch the dump, bang. You hit your head down, now watch this, you're out. Watch He's this. Done right he, he is done, but now so are you. Now You're now unconscious. Now Look at you roll over. You're completely unconscious. My arms your eyes. I understand, but your eyes were rolled back in your head. You were out cold. No, I wasn't. But what about this all time great mismatch? Where the credentialed boxing legend James Tony decided to trash talk the entire sport of mixed martial arts, calling it a joke and promising that he would beat any active MMA fighter on the planet. Funnily enough, Dana White accepted that challenge, and Tony was absolutely ragdolled by Randy Couture on live TV for our viewing pleasure. One of the weirdest MMA fights of all time. But not all ridiculous moments need to be drawn out. No, this otherwise uninteresting matchup between Smilin' Sam Alvey and Dylan Andrews was made legendary by some random crowd member's decision to shout instructions at the fighters and as soon as he did, the whole arena erupted in laughter, along with the two athletes themselves. Things like this just never seem to happen these days. Then it's looking like, uh, it's looking like Andrews has done his research as well. I, I've, I've missed something, Dan, but the crowd are really getting involved here, and both fighters responding. Love Diego Sanchez is a true one-of-a-kind, a totally intense character who was known for his wildly entertaining fighting style. And when his chin eventually dropped off, he was still revered by the sports fan base for his years of service, even if his interviews got weirder and weirder. And when he walked to the cage to face Jake Ellenberger with a crucifix in his hand, it was just about as determined a fighter walkout we had ever seen. A very peculiar character, but a hero to all fight fans. From one fighting hero to another, it's kinda crazy just how long Alistair Overeem managed to extend his career and his bout with Stipe Miocic at UFC 203 showcased the Ream using every tactic at his disposal to get the win. This included blatantly running away from the heavyweight champ, and after getting KO'd in yet another all-time awkward post-fight interview, he tried to claim that Stipe had tapped to a half-locked in guillotine earlier in the round. Once again, Rogan decided to make a fool out of this clearly confused fighter, walking him through the submission sequence on live TV. You just can't script this stuff. Thoughts on what happened? I believe when I punched him, when he went down, I followed him, I got him in the guillotine choke, and I clearly felt the tap. The ref didn't see it, the ref didn't jump in, so the fight continued. But in my opinion, he tapped, and, um, it's a bummer. Yes, the referee didn't, uh, didn't come in, so, but he clearly tapped. Well, let's take a look at it. We'll have the truck pull it, and let's look at the big screen. You grabbed a hold of the guillotine, you held on strong. Speaking of totally unscripted moments of MMA hilarity, we gotta just let Derek Lewis take the stage next. 
Lewis had just pulled off the comeback of a lifetime, KOing Alexander Volkov with just 13 seconds on the clock. And when the time came to take the mic, what followed was complete and utter perfection. How can you even describe this total masterpiece of a post-fight interview? I'm here with the winner, Derek Lewis. Derek, why'd you take your pants off? It was, my balls was hot. I understand. I need to sit my black ass down and do some more cardio. Fuck what you talking about right now. I ain't trying to fight for no title right now. Don't have no gas tank like that. She. Thanks for having me. Hey, maybe next week or sometime or two weeks from now, I'm going to come on your show and smoke some weed with you. Anytime, sir. Anytime. But for every post-fight interview that hits, you have something like what happened to Paul Buontello. Calling on his fans to repeat his seemingly famous catchphrase, this heavyweight contender was left with, well, no fans to answer him. A true tragedy inside the cage. All right, I want to say one thing. See if I got some fans out here. You ready? Here we go. Don't fear me. Come on, baby. Hey, you know, don't fear me, fear the consequences, baby. On the long list, stay with a brutal KO like it was nothing. Mike Perry is another man who is known for brutal KOs and a genuinely tough attitude. But when he tried to walk out to the theme tune from the Halo video game franchise and the UFC accidentally put on Halo by Beyonce, he decided to go with it. And the results were totally hilarious. Coming off a pretty disciplined win, DC, I thought over Mickey Gall in June inside this very building. What the I showed that he has a well-rounded skill set. Hey, somebody said that Woo! this was interesting music by Mike Perry in my ear. And Mike goes, what is this song? They put on the wrong song. But Mike, look at him. He just kind of rolled on it, right? That's Mike Perry for you. Just kind of rolled with the punches. I mean, Mike Perry. He picked it, maybe. I don't know what happened. He picked this song. He, he picked, picked the song. Did he? forgot. I mean, he forgot he picked it. <laughs> There's nothing stronger than a parent's love for their kid, but in this case, we're guessing that Chris Weidman would have been happier without it. After losing his middleweight title by brutal TKO at the hands of a very dominant Luke Rockhold, Weidman's morale must have been at an all-time low. Pushed to give an interview post-fight, Weidman did what he could to assure his fans that he would be back. But just as it seemed like the interview was over, his father, Ray Weidman, grabbed the microphone and made the most ill-fitting declaration of love for his son. Look, the sentiment was kinda beautiful, but the execution was absolutely atrocious. Thank you very much, sir. And everybody, thank you! And this is still my boy! And how could we ever make a list of all-time ridiculous MMA moments and not include the infamous ice spill? The concept was simple. Two UFC champions in Jose Aldo and Hernan Barrao were serving as cornermen to their teammate Ronis Torres when one of them accidentally spilled a bucket of ice on the octagon floor. Cue a clearly outraged Joe Rogan and one of the most hilarious outbursts we have ever seen on the commentary desk. And looking back on it now, it seems as though he doesn't even know that it is Aldo and Barrao he's speaking to. Right there. I've never seen you so excited. Well, I don't want anybody to fall and break their head. This is yeah, ridiculous. I'm looking at what? ice on the ground. Oh, the less time we spend on this one, the better. Fighting is a very physical sport, and sometimes the mind is pushing in one way and the body is pushing in another. And for Justine Kish, getting beaten by Felice Herrig was only the beginning of her problems. As it turned out, Kish had left it all in the octagon that night, including something a little extra on the canvas. Yeah, this one is just flat out disgusting. There's no other way to put it. Greg Hardy was a pretty controversial figure for the entirety of the time he spent in the UFC. Some of this was down to his past problems outside of the sport. But he did actually make his transition. His grasp on the rule set left us with some truly bizarre moments in the cage. Chief among these was the time that Hardy somehow thought it was okay for him to use an inhaler in between rounds. Like, seriously, he actually thought that was legal. Thankfully, he was punished and the fight's result was changed. But man, that's one crazy oversight to make. Back in the early days of the UFC, you actually had the choice to wear wrestling shoes if you so desired. But the one drawback to this was that you weren't allowed to kick for obvious reasons. 
Well, this absolutely genius fighter somehow missed the memo on that, and despite being warned repeatedly against kicking his opponent, he just kept doing it and doing it, until the fight was eventually waved off. An all-time great, low-fight IQ moment. Quentin Rampage Jackson has better comedic timing than some professional comedians. And when he returned to the UFC and took on Fabio Maldonado, his total inability to pronounce the Brazilian's name was just too hilarious to leave out of this video. Considering that he spent months training for this fight too, it's just baffling that he never got around to learning how to say it. Mabababo, how you say his name? <laughs> Fabio Maldonado. Fabio Mabababo. When a fighter doesn't want to engage, good luck trying to make them fight. And for Nate Quarry, the only thing he could actually do to make this final minute of his bout with Caleb Starnes interesting for the fans was to openly mock him. And yeah, the UFC cut this dude from the roster as quick as can be in the post-fight. Who knows what Peter Yan was thinking when he decided to throw away a comfortable lead in a championship fight and knee Aljamain Sterling in the face when he was clearly grounded. Sure, it was a solid strike, but Jan lost the fight. He lost the belt, and he lost the respect of many fans for his troubles. A totally baffling mid-fight decision. And finally, we come to one of the craziest and most blatantly disrespectful things the UFC has ever done. John Jones failed a pre-fight drug test in the lead-up to UFC 232, causing the Nevada State Athletic Commission to step in and attempt to pull him. With their primary attraction in danger of falling off the bill, the UFC instead decided to move the entire event to California six days before it was set to happen. This messed with the travel plans of so many fans, but obviously the UFC didn't care, and Jones very smugly shot down any attempts from journalists to, you know, do actual journalism. And you thought UFC 294's fight week was crazy. Sit down. I'm sitting down. Well, I want to Thank take you. the mic from her. Better questions. Better I journalism. I, I, don't, I don't understand what your question is. What, is what, there a what's the reason? Better journalism. Better journalism. You suck. Body. Better journalism. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let him talk. What, what, what's the question? What's the reason for John Jones having a picogram in his body? I don't know. We, we, yeah. That's been the topic of that's this why entire. I'm him. Yeah, well, you, 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 I, I told you, like I told.